Hey friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is Stanley Smith. He's going to tell you a great story about Blaze Foley. First memory of Blaze was I would go downtown, and there was a place called the Raven's Garage, which later turned into Emo's, the famous Emo's Club. But when it was Raven's Garage, it had a big beer garden, and I knew that I, I had gone to sit in several times with this family band, they played kind of countryish music with some Georgia on my mind and stuff. And it was a, a supernatural family band. I, I just had a good time playing my clarinet with these people. And I think the second or third time I uh, sat in with them, it was at a time when the state legislature of Texas had been held over for a special session, <laughs> which is a big deal down there, you know. So the Raven's Garage was crawling with politicians. And it was also crawling with prostitutes. <laughs> and we're playing along there. And uh, I look through the middle of the crowd and I see these people coming down this aisleway. And it's Blaze with, with a little bit of an entourage with him. And he's coming down the, there, there was, in between the seats, there was a, grassy area he's walking down through there and connie sees him and she says blaze you know southern accent blaze because the hancock family was from lubbock texas just another group of musicians from lubbock that took over austin (laughs) thank goodness (laughs) and so it was just in no time she had blaze up there and handed him her acoustic guitar, and says, do one, Blaze. And, and I, you know, there's no way he would have had time to realize that the place was full of politicians and prostitutes, but I did. <laughs> and I, I'm going, oh, geez. <laughs> and I, I was familiar with who Blaze was because I'd heard all the Kerrville stories and everything about wearing a dress to get in. And so Blaze picked up the guitar, and he just starts strumming the Oval Room which was a perfect song for me. I mean, I'd, and I'd, I'd heard that one, but only maybe once or twice. But uh, I was overjoyed that that song he kicked in on because it's kind of a little minor key thing. In fact, that song always, it reminds me of a, of a Bob Dylan song, You Gotta Serve Somebody. You Gotta Serve Somebody, you know. And this one's, he's the president, you know, in his rocking chair, you know song just the clarinet just fit in perfectly for that song and so i'm like getting chills while we're playing it you know and blaze is just he's got a rock solid way of finger picking you know that when he gets into that kind of i don't know if it's a travis pick or whatever it is but you know alternating bass thing he was he when he got locked into that he was he was on time when i got home that night that whole scene started ganging up on me in my head, you know. I says, geez, did I just, I mean, did he just do that song in that setting with that place full of all these politicians and prostitutes? And I said, yes, he did, and I got to play on it, you know. And so I've, over the years, I've told that, I've became good friends with Connie Hancock and and some of those people, and uh, I told her, I says, do you realize Back then when we when Blaze sat in, that what was going on, and she said, oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think I, I mentioned it maybe to Gurf one time. I, was, I did a recording session at his house one time for somebody. But, but I, you know, I still, that's kind of my favorite song, I, even though he's written some that are probably better. But that song really hits, rings a bell. I listened to it earlier today, you know. And I even... I have the vinyl record, uh, the Muscle Shoals record of that out in my garage somewhere. So that was my introduction to actually meeting Blaze. The next time I remember seeing Blaze was uh, Scheidel and I lived in that Floyd Domino rental house. It was a nice, big, big old nice house. I think one night we were sitting out on the porch, just hanging out, kind of getting late, and Blaze come walking by. And, and Dave says, Blaze, Blaze, come on up. Come on up on the porch, you know. And, 
And he came up and sat there, and we just did small talk, like just a bunch of old men sitting on a porch, you know. And then we went in, and Blaze had a little half pint or a pint of vodka in his jacket, and, you know. And but he was just, just as it was. It, we didn't even talk music. I don't think that much, you know. It was just like uh, just talking stuff, you know. And it got kind of late, and. Uh, I think we agreed that he could sleep on the couch. I worked at a hardware store in the daytime, so so the next morning I, I was going to work and I walked through the house and there was Blaze sawing Z's on the couch and I went on to work. So that was the next time I you know had an encounter with Blaze, and then he he slept on our couch maybe twice I think, but he didn't take full advantage of it because <laughs> <laughs> but. And I'd, I'd heard, by then, you know, I'd heard so many stories. Like, I think Scheidel told me, he says, uh, he says, you know what that BFI stands for on the dumpsters? And I says, what? He says, Blaze Foley inside. <laughs> You've probably heard that before. <laughs> but uh, I think another time I met De- Blaze was, uh, it was his another one of his birthdays. And I went down there. I'd been to the Half Price Bookstore, which is right up the street. And I walked on down to the outhouse, through my down my alley, through the so I couldn't get <laughs> lost. And I noticed everybody was giving Blaze little presents and stuff. And I, I didn't have anything, or I didn't think I did. But I just bought a cassette tape at the Half Price Bookstore, but it was of Woody Herman, you know jazz clarinet player you know so i said well what the hell <laughs> and, and I, I walk up to blaze and i said blaze this is for you a little jazz for you he said oh man and he looked at me i could tell it the look in his face he says you poor dude you didn't have anything but you gave me what you have and that means a lot you know <laughs> and that's exactly what it was you know i don't know i remember that night, that like seeing his expression on his face, that is when I decided this guy's kind of like a little boy. Part of him, he's got a little boy thing. And then I, you know, stories I've heard about him always like buying little trinkets and toys, little tiny things, and he'd always give them to people. And I can just see his face somehow like that, sort of like a little mischief. I never saw Blaze in his when he when he was supposedly being a bad boy because <laughs> I know it happened because he's kicked out of every everywhere on the street on the drag and uh, hole in the wall or you know the Texas showdown or the, and Chuck would have to kick him out once in a while. <laughs>